What up, world? Building Downtown, Jay Kelly here. Joining us, Amy Barton, as always. And today, joining us is Canada's favorite ambulance chaser. It's Combat Sports Regulatory Lawyer, er, lawyer Eric. And I should ask this before we start it, because I've been watching clips of you, and everybody says your last name differently. Is it? What? What is it? Is it McGracken, McGracken, Magrakin? Which one do we go with? So your first one is spot on. McGracken is good. McGracken. And your third one is probably more how it's supposed to be pronounced. It's an Estonian name. I don't speak Estonian, but people <laughs> that do pronounce it the third way that you did. Oh, <laughs> perfect. At least we got that cleared up. Now, uh, being a lawyer, you're uh, you're used to fighting, but you might have the biggest fight of your life on your hands now. The gangster from Westland, Oregon, Chael Sutton is coming after you. Well, yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> I, I woke up, yeah, I guess it was yesterday, and, and I had a direct message from him. And I don't want to say he was coming after me, but he was he, he was certainly disagreeing with something I said, but he didn't give any context. I had no idea what he was referring to because I tweet too much for my own good. I, <laughs> I've got like 30 tweets in a day, so I have no idea what he disagreed with. But no, I, I, I reached out to him, found out what, what he disagreed with, and had a nice discussion. And... um you know, at the end of the day, I don't think he and I see eye to eye on, on it, but uh, <laughs> it's all in DMs, so I don't want to talk publicly about what, what he and I chatted about. But yeah, that was a that was a weird um, distraction yesterday. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Chael's like that. I told Amy about it. And uh, throughout the years, there's been a few times he's DM'd me and you can't DM him back. He turns his DMs off, right? Or if he doesn't follow, you can't DM him back or something like that. So it would always drive right. me nuts. He'd shoot me a quick message. And I'd be like, no, let's continue this conversation. The conversation is dead. He sets his point across and you just got to accept it. Yeah, no, he's got a he's got a different style in terms of how he goes through life. Yeah, that's for sure. But yeah, like I said, I want to have you on here. You know, this uh, the antitrust stuff with the UFC, the USADA stuff. You're pretty much, from what I see, the man to talk to. The one thing, though, before we get into any of it, uh. I would think your phone would be rigging off the hook, but a lot of people don't want to piss off Dana White. They don't want to piss off the UFC. So has there been a lot of people asked, like journalists covering the sport, asking you to come out and speak more and give some more expertise on this? Yeah, sometimes. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty good about saying yes if people, you know, media reach out to me and, yeah. and chat, you know, just like this podcast. Like I'm I'm happy to have constructive discussions with people. Um, but in terms of, you know, antitrust is, is a little bit boring to cover, and I, I think it's I think it's the most important story in combat sports. Um, and some reporters, you know, you know, like Bloody Elbow does such a good job covering mm -hmm. it. If you if you follow that site, they've probably reported on the lawsuit better than anybody out there okay. right now. Because um, they're not credentialed, so they have nothing to lose. That thing's set for trial, I think, in April next year. So so media is going to be hopping all over that story once the jury comes up with their decision if it goes that far mm -hmm. and i watched the uh the interview you did with uh james lynch uh i've known james from when he lived here in the, the toronto area he's a great guy and uh everyone after you're done listening to this listen to this first but afterwards i do recommend checking that out uh, lynch mma um you went really into depth with the the uh, antitrust thing the one thing that you spoke about on there a little bit is the injunction that could change the way the UFC does business. Is that correct? Yeah. So, so the fighters basically are asking for two things. One is money, right? Mm -hmm. They're they're suing, saying they were harmed because of the UFC's anti-competitive business practices. And if if they win on that aspect, the UFC could be on the hook for billions of dollars. But the second thing they're asking for is an injunction. They're you know they're basically saying. We were harmed by all this stuff, but the UFC is still doing it. So the, the new generation and the next generation of fighters are going to be harmed. So the UFC has to be reined in mm -hmm. and they can't do business as usual. And and so just, just to be less vague about it, the, the main thing that they're asking for is to limit the UFC to one year contracts. So, you know, they, they sign John Jones, they sign whoever to a new deal they're asking the court to limit those contracts to one year for everybody because that way fighters are going to be on the open market regularly mm -hmm. so other promoters could bid for those fighters and that's going to go a long way to increasing fighter pay because 
as soon as you know it's, it's just basic economics if you have if you have um regular access to the market more people are going to try to participate in that market so more more promoters will get in the business and fighters could be far better off if if they get the injunction that they're looking for mm. and this started in what like 2016 17 something like that i forget but but i think i think it's about nine years in right now this lawsuit wow does it typically take this long for something this big no so so lawsuits are slow right and Mm -hmm. antitrust lawsuits and class action lawsuits are slow and this is all of those things uh but but this one's particularly slow the judge the judge did nothing for almost two years i think like there, there was a certification hearing and the judge basically said, yeah, I think I'm going to certify it. And then nothing happened. It was just basically paused for almost two years. But it's moving quickly now. After after the judge certified it, he basically said he's fast tracking it and and set it for trial next spring. So things are going to move really quickly right now. So this would have been filed when Zufa was still the owners, correct? Yeah, correct. So, so does that how does that work now with uh WME being the new owners? Is this Zoof on the hook for this or is WME, you know what I mean, you take the problems when you bought the company? Yeah, normally normally when you buy a company, you buy its problems, right? You get its mm-hmm. assets, but you get its problems, but you could structure deals differently. So so you could sell the business and the old owners could be on the hook or the old owners might have to indemnify you if you pay damages. But I, I think, I don't know, is, is the short answer to, to your question, who's on the hook? I assume it's the current owners, but I don't know if there's any kind of deals made along the way about who's left holding the bag. Mm. And that would be something I would assume you'd have to disclose going into the sale? Like, w, this isn't news oh. to WME, right? Yeah, no, no, 100%. It wouldn't be news to them. I'm, I'm sure they did their due diligence. And, and yeah, it would have been disclosed. And do you, like, are there things that stand out from the past that like I know there was there was one thing at the start of this Dana White had like a a tombstone with affliction and all the other companies that he took out things like that don't look real good are there are there things in your mind that you know over the years like oh shit if that comes out they're in some serious trouble if you pull up if you pull up the lawsuit filing the pleadings the plaintiff's lawyers actually put that right in there they put they put that picture of Dana really? White with the tomb- oh, yeah yeah with the tombstone oh. And and they even put that world fucking domination photo you saw it right. It, it's yeah. the Fertitta standing there right on stage, and they've got the octagon in the shape of the world, and it says world fucking domination. They put they put those pictures right in the lawsuit. I thought that was very, you know, that was a crafty move just to mm-hmm. just to sort of paint the picture. But but most of the dirt that. Um, has come out. I, I, yeah, I was about to say I think most of it has come out, but I don't think so. I think there's actually a little bit more yet to come out. But that lawsuit has done such a brilliant job. Like, like all the credit to to um, you know Rob Macy is the lawyer that that engineered it, started it. That's the guy behind the Mixed Martial Arts Fighters Association, and then they hired s- some very heavy hitting antitrust lawyers. So, so all the credit in the world to those guys for fighting the good fight and getting it this far. But that lawsuit in their effort has shed more light on the sort of, you know, dirty business practices in MMA than probably anything to date. So, so I, I think there's more stuff coming. Like it's rumored, it's rumored that there's emails or text messages from managers to the UFC, basically throwing their own clients under the bus, saying they'll take less money for their fighters to take about just so the managers could cozy up and get them the good graces of the promoter. So I think there's other ugly stuff that, that they're sitting on. And if it ever goes to trial, I think those bombshells will probably hit. Yeah. Management. It's not a a bombshell. It's just just milky. (laughs) That, uh, that, uh, the interview you did with James there, another thing you touched on is managers and, uh, there's zero, uh, uh, barrier of entrance to be a manager at MMA. Correct. Like if you say I'm a manager, guess what? Congratulations, you are. Right? It's it's that's it's that simple in a lot of jurisdictions. Uh, some places you got to pay a fee and get licensed, but you know it's like a hundred, two hundred dollars. Um, some places, I think New York on the books has some simple um, requirements, like they could test you and 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 you know make sure you are qualified. But the 
Yeah, yeah. It's basically if you say you're a manager, that's it. It's not like the other pro sports. Mm -hmm. And so you get a lot of, you know, not the best characters yeah. um, entering the business. One, you know, one thing I've been working on. So, so we, we petitioned the Association of Boxing Commissions. That's, you know, all these regulators get together once a year mm -hmm. under the umbrella called the ABC. And they, they sort of, you know, trying to unify all the rules. And so we petitioned the ABC to have a fighters committee and they said, yes. So, so this got launched sometime in the last year, I forget exactly when, but one of our first projects on the fighters committee was to ask for them to actually, you know, create manager standards. So, mm -hmm. so, so I sort of spam it out on Twitter from time to time, but we've got standards mimicking the major league sports that the ABC could adopt uh, you know, I'm not sure how quickly the commissions are going to line up and and listen to what the fighters are saying. But yeah, fighters do need better managers in the sport and they need better standards for those managers. Mm -hmm. In the other bigger big leagues, NFL, NBA, NHL, whatever, uh, what are some of the uh, some of the uh, requirements you have to have? Isn't one of them you have to be a lawyer or something like that? Or is that incorrect? Yeah, yeah sometimes it's a lawyer or or a certain number of years of higher education. Um, or, you know, you know, more than anything else, you have to pass a certification course, right? So, so, you know, you don't necessarily need a law degree or to do a whole bunch of post-secondary education to be a good manager. You can get people, you know, that are high school dropouts that have <laughs> incredible life skills yeah. and can do, you know, you know, can do very well. And, and I don't know that you need that kind of a barrier to entry, but the main thing they do is they have you know, fairly rigorous certification tests. And, and so you got to pass this stuff. You got to prove you understand fiduciary duty. You have to you know, prove you know how to look out for your guys having some basic legal and contractual knowledge. Um, but, but the other thing those sports do is they limit what the managers could charge for, right? So, so you have mm. collectively bargained minimum pay. You know, I forget the numbers, but you know, if, if you're in the NHL, I think the bare minimum you're getting is about half a million a year. And so the manager that gets you in there, negotiates your contract, they can't touch that first half a million because they didn't do a single thing mm -hmm. to earn that for you. And, you know, MMA, you get a guy signed to the UFC and they've got these lockstep contracts, 10 and 10 or 12 and 12. And some managers are taking, you know, 25, 30% of that. And they didn't, they didn't bump up that pay. Like, like that pay would have been exactly the same with or without the manager. And so things like that need a bit of scrutiny because fighters have it pretty rough on a lot of angles in terms of, you know, um, you know, the industry's monopsonized by the UFC and wages mm -hmm. are um, suppressed artificially because of that. They've got, you know, the sponsorship market is basically non-existent now in, in MMA. And then you get managers taking a big slice of the action of these base salaries that they're not, they're not putting more money in their fighters pockets. So things like that, you know, could have improvement. I think, I think there's, yeah, we, there's room for advocacy in this field. Yeah. We were, we had Rod Frazier on a couple months back and, um, you know, that is Randy Couture's old boxing coach. You know what I'm talking right. about? Yeah. So Ron was, I, on I don't and, know him, but but yeah, you're familiar with what I'm speaking of. Um, the black dude that wears the do rag all the time, the man in the do rag, as we call him, he's been on the show a bunch of times. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Ron was on. He was talking. He didn't drop any names, which is fine. But he said there's a manager he kn knows of or knew of that they take twenty percent of everything that their fighters bring in: show money, win bonus, sponsorship money, discretionary bonuses, any of it. Like who that is? There anyone there? to protect the fighters in that thing? Like, I'm sure if a fighter came to you and said, hey, I got a question, you'd give him a hand or whatever, but is there anyone out there that's offering that service? I actually tweeted that one day. I said, hey, if you're really if you're a fighter and you're about to sign your manager contract, reach out to me. I'll review it free of charge. And every manager because hated you after that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. No, no, you know there's, there's some good managers in the business. Um, but, but there's some really, I put it this way, the, the first contract fighters sign is often the worst and that's their manager contract, right? Like the manager is the guy that's supposed to look out for the fighter's best interests in every dealing, except for that first contract, right? Cause the manager is mm -hmm. looking after their own interests in that contract. So fighters would be smart to get independent advice on that contract. And yeah, I've seen, I, I you know, just over there, uh, on, on my other desk, I'm 
got about 20 different manager contracts and oh, they're all over the map in terms of the percentages. But yeah, I've seen some that are terrible, like five years in length. They take a cut of everything, 30%. Whoa. And you're right, the the, the base pay, the, the win bonus, the performance of the night bonus, any kind of sponsorship they bring to the table, anything and everything, even if they have nothing to do with securing that. And so, mm. you know, like those things are, you know, like that's just a bad contract. Fighters need to push back on some of those terms. And the, the other thing that happened in the industry, just because the UFC is so powerful, is they basically cozy up to a few managers, right? And and so, like, the managers, I forget who says this, I think it's one of the guys at Bloody Elbow, but he always calls them brokers, not managers. Like, they just bring <laughs> the talent to the UFC. They're not really pushing back against the UFC. And so, so fighters almost have no choice but to then line up with some of these favorite managers to get on the UFC's radar. And that's just a tough system to be in, right? Like it's it, it's tough to get ahead um, if if that's the management landscape that you're working with. So, so yeah, I'd like to see better reform. I'd like to see the I'd like to see the um, athletic commissions just step up their game a little bit and mm-hmm. make it tougher for people to be a manager and give fighters rights as between them and the manager and make it easy to enforce those rights. The one thing, obviously, it's been a huge topic for years, is the union. People think that'll be the end all be all, right? This class action suit, if it goes through, it goes the fighter's way. Do you think that's going to be the first real big step to getting an, a real legit union in there? No, but no. but it in and of itself would be the be all end all, right? Like like mm-hmm. if that succeeds, it's not that it breaks up the UFC, but it takes away the UFC's market power. Because imagine if every single one of their stars, like Sean O'Malley or uh, John Jones or whoever, Mm -hmm. imagine if every one of them was a free agent every single year. Now all of a sudden, whether it's one, whether it's PFL, whether it's some billionaire that, you know, never bothered getting into the game, now wants to get into the game, Mm -hmm. there's going to be so much market competition for the fighters that um, the UFC is going to lose a lot of their power. And so there wouldn't ever be a need for a union. Like, Like this is... This is its own sort of like lengthy discussion, but the UFC having so much power over the fighters almost create an employment type of a situation. And if they have this power imbalance and the courts don't shake it up, unionization is one of those possible remedies, right? And and it basically comes down to, are they truly independent contractors or employees? Mm -hmm. But if, if the antitrust lawsuit succeeds it's going to strip so much power away from the ufc and put it back in the hands of the fighters that they really will be independent contractors like i don't think there's going to be any question about that on this open market and and i don't think any single promoter would have so much power that they could create this employment kind of a situation that Mm -hmm. the ufc has going with their fighters does that make sense yes yes definitely uh so could it negatively affect other promotions as well? Could it be, could they be forced to change their business practices? Well, no. So so they benefit the most because yeah. antitrust law. Here, here, I'll answer that. Then I'll ramble a little bit. That's all the right. Other, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The other the other promoters are are the ones who are now going to have access to these big name fighters, right? So it's mm. like, hey, I wanna. I want to sign John Jones. Damn it, I can't. He's under contract for five more years with the UFC. Well, no, next year he's on the open market. So I could open up my wallet and make a fair bid to bring this guy on board. So so the other guys would benefit big time. Now the antitrust remedy, if it goes through, it only applies to the UFC, even though other promote promoters use the same dirty business practices, Mm -hmm. like like these terrible contracts that are long-term and exploitative, et cetera. But the antitrust remedy only uh, applies to the big fish, right? Like you need to have Mm -hmm. market dominance before you come under antitrust scrutiny. And so it applies to the UFC. But what would happen is the UFC would now lose the ability to do this. And when these other promoters are now bidding, no fighters are going to sign like a six-year, five-year contract with one championship if they know they can get good money with the UFC and it's only a one-year deal. So the other industry is going to have to adapt. Like right now, they all imitate the UFC with these gross contracts. Mm -hmm. But if the UFC is forced to not have these oppressive contracts, then 
no nobody else could get away with it but right mm. now the way it works is every single promoter i shouldn't say everyone but almost every promoter uses the same business model yep and so fighters don't have an easy option with anybody like like basically you sign an mma contract you're going to be locked up for a very long time um at at basically the promoter's mercy mm -hmm. amy is something you want to say so yeah, I have a question. So let's say it all goes through and, and Dana White's head spins off his shoulders and WME gets mad and stomps their little feet. Um, great. You know, they're free agents every year. Hallelujah. Um, unless and until there's some kind of tiff between the biggest fighters and WME or, or Dana, they're never going to leave because that's where their home is. But like, my question is when you see these giant class actions and the antitrust things, like we've talked about, the trickle down effect is not fast saying, Oh, well, anybody can bid on them in, in a year now. It sounds delightful, but like, what does it look like for any company that's not the UFC to outbid the UFC on a John yeah. Jones or a Connor? Yeah, I think they I don't think have money like that. So what does it look like? Yeah. I think it ends up looking a lot more like boxing, right? Where, where fighters, um, have property rights in their rank and title. So, so the number one guy with the belt, it doesn't matter if you're in the UFC or not, that guy, if they have market power, other people are going to bid for that fighter services and the promoters are going to have to co-promote. They're going to have to play ball with each other to put on the big fights. Like I don't think anybody out of the US at least is going to be able to try to monopolize the market. That can't be your business plan coming in. It's, it's going to have to be to make good money off of smart fights along the way right you want to sign the right people at the right time and make make good money the way boxing promoters do but you can't put together this empire that the ufc has mm -hmm. and do you think that could cause cards to suffer as well because we get pretty stacked ufc cards even preliminary cards now whereas in boxing you'll get a lot of bs all the way up until the main event right so could that also be something that you know viewers are going to have to sacrifice yeah, I think I, I I don't quite know what it would look like, but mm -hmm. again, my 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 sort of easiest default is to say what's happening in boxing would probably become a bit more of the norm in MMA if if the antitrust lawsuit sort of shakes things up the way it can. And how is like the NHL or the NFL? How are they not monopolizing or whatever the term they're using for the, what the UFC is doing the antitrust lawsuit? Because they have a yeah, stranglehold on the market as they, well, they, do they not? What 100%, they are? But, oh, <laughs> yeah, but, but no, no, you're right. You're right. Like, that's a very that's a very smart observation. And the difference is that they have collective bargaining agreements. So, so the sort of normal playbook here is you have these entities, and it is monopolized, and you have all these anti-competitive um, agreements in place, but the players all get together and they have a union and then you have a collective bargaining agreement. And during the term of that agreement, you can't make an antitrust claim against the league. And so, so the playbook, if you follow these sports every now and then the collective agreement runs its course. And mm -hmm. then there's the threat of an antitrust lawsuit. Like that's, that's always, you know, it's kind of like the players are locked out or else the players are striking and they're trying to negotiate a new deal and what's underlying all of that is if they don't work things out, the players will sue for an antitrust remedy. And, and that's happened a couple of times in, in you know, like the major league sports history. But these lawyers didn't invent this model like like it's worked for sports for for decades. So it's it's an old story. It's just finally being applied to MMA um, oh, okay. and it's probably overdue to be applied to, yeah. to, to MMA. And do you think part of the reason you don't uh, hear it talked about as much in other sports is because, you know, they're making 20, 30 million a year. They got Nike endorsements, Gatorade endorsements. They get a cut of the 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 uh, TV money, the broadcast money. So do you think that kind of keeps them a little more content where they don't need to go ruffle any feathers, feathers and threaten a lawsuit? Yeah, like in, in the in the most basic of terms, those other athletes enjoy 50% of the revenues, right? Like it's more or less a 50-50 split. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like a partnership because those leagues and those athletes, they want to grow the revenues together because the next time 
they you know renegotiate things, it's 50% of a bigger high is going to the athletes. And, and so it's truly really a win-win. Whereas here, you know, like the UFC signs a new deal with Bud Light, you forget the number, it was like a hundred million dollars. Well, not one penny of that money is gonna go in the fighter's pocket, right? Mm -hmm. And so so yeah, the 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 athletes in the major league sports are treated way better because over the generations they fought for those rights and so now they have a much better landscape and 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 all this is is you're seeing it come to MMA but but again it's not the wheel being reinvented it's just it's just this old tried and true legal set of rights and remedies is finally being applied to you know this relatively new thing called MMA and with the the antitrust lawsuit stuff that Obviously, there was stuff that came out when it was filed, but things that happen right now, present day, can they be added and brought forth to the suit? Yeah, so so there's two antitrust lawsuits. The first one covers all the fighters, or almost all the fighters, from 2010 mm -hmm. to 2017. And then a second antitrust lawsuit was filed. I think it's all the same lawyers involved. I'm quite certain of it. And and that's looking to certify second class from 2017 right into the present day. So, yeah, the short answer is everything the UFC is continuing to do is going to get subject to antitrust scrutiny in that second lawsuit, assuming it gets certified. Mm. And now with the USADA thing. You know, I, I, I have Sorry, another timing ahead. question, though. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, the timing. Well, when we when you go back that far, um, I admittedly, like would always catch the highlights and followed some of the fighters that were kind of trying to spearhead it, but I didn't really follow it closely. Did when, when the first group of fighters wanted to unionize and they were pushing for unionization, was that something that just got some attention and then went away? Or was that kind of the impetus of all of this ball starting to roll towards this lawsuit? There's, there's been a few efforts to unionize and, and none of them really ever went anywhere. Um, and, and no, so there, those efforts are almost at the polar opposite end of the antitrust lawsuit, like, like the MMAFA, the guys doing the antitrust lawsuit are against the idea of unionization. They believe, right. I don't want to speak for them, but this is just my, my understanding of their position. Um, they believe that fighters truly are independent contractors and that they have no business ever being in an employment employer relationship. And then other fighters said, no, the, the, you know, look at these contracts. We basically are employees, so let's all get together and let's unionize. And the closest anybody came to succeeding, it was Leslie Smith. Leslie Smith got um, cut from the UFC, and she she was vocal. She was making um, noise right. about mm -hmm. um you know, the UFC and, and some of their sort of bad business practices. And so she argued that when they cut her, they were retaliating against her. And so so there's basically a shortcut. Instead of getting everybody together and voting to unionize, if you could prove you were retaliated against for trying to unionize, she herself was going to be able to get a ruling whether she was an employee or an independent contractor. And that thing really looked like it might succeed. But that was during the Trump administration. And from high on down, they basically killed that um mm. you know the federal government killed it so holy shit um yeah yeah and so i don't know i don't know if there's any big push right now to unionize um it, it's so tough because the fighters are all over the world from different countries they're never you know sort of like like you never get this critical mass under one roof it, it's tough to get that many people together um, to, to move um leslie's lawyer was a guy named lucas middlebrook and he started Project Spearhead, and that was that was his effort to unionize. And he did a really good job. Like I, I applauded his efforts, and, and I liked how far he got. But again, it it just sort of died on the vine. And right now, the antitrust lawsuit is is just by far the biggest um, thing that the fighters have going for them. Mm -hmm. And the thing with uh, you saw the split ways out of nowhere. Did something like that could that harm the UFC in this case? Because you saw this supposed to be the ones that, you know, protect the fighters and protect them from uh, dirty fighters and all these other things. And now, you know, they're at they're out of the mix. So what does that say? It says that you don't care about the fighter's safety as much in my eyes. Yeah. anyway. Yeah. And like, I don't know if that has any bearing on it. Um, okay. 
I I always thought that the Fertitas brought in USADA just to just to give the sport a better image to help them yeah, get that four too. billion dollar sale that they got. Yep. Like I never <laughs> right. I never had the sense they did it to help the fighters. I just thought it was it was kind of like the uniform, right? They get the Reebok deal in and they give it a sort of a cleaner look and um you bring in the anti-doping so so outside money thought it was maybe a safer investment i think i think that's all that they were up to and then the contract just ran its natural uh course so mm. somebody observed this and i thought they were right they, they they point out that now you have uh tko right so you have ufc and wwe under one umbrella mm -hmm. and WWE do whatever they've done for in-house anti-doping. It definitely is not you said <laughs> rigorous. And so the idea, I think, was just as simple as when that contract runs its course, just follow this WWE model because it's probably a lot cheaper mm -hmm. and it's probably easier to control, right? Because USADA was, as much criticism as they got, they were arm's length and they did you know, take a take a hard line, whether you know, whether right or wrong. It was the yeah. sort of independent arbitrator handing out their punishment and now it's just all going in-house so so the ufc is going to have way more control over anti-doping right now so are we going to see pride all over again well, i don't think so <laughs> oh, God. i think i think that's called ksw these days right isn't that where with puchinowski <laughs> yeah right right they got they got some big boys on those cards i know it was, there was just an event on last saturday actually and uh, oh, yeah. yeah, I put it on for a few minutes, and uh, Puchinowski was headlining. I think he headlines all of their cards. Um, yeah, that it seems like it. I, right. I don't really follow it. Just just the few times I've sort of yeah. tuned in. Yeah, it just it, it seems like they got it. You know, it reminds me of Pride without making yep. any allegations yeah. about anybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because with the the new company that's taking over the drug testing, somebody posted their mission statement and. They work with their clients to come up with a unique form of testing that suits their clients. What the hell are you talking about? Just test for peds, right? There's no unique yeah. Yeah. structure. <laughs> now nah, we'll leave that one off the list. Nah, that one's okay. No, it's funny. In fact, I think it was me that posted that mission statement. So yeah, as soon as as soon as they mentioned the organization, I looked oh, them up and, and that jumped out at me because it was basically it was basically, hey, we're we're open for business, right? Like we're a very flexible drug testing company. That's the you know that's the message they were giving people, and they're getting the business that they want. But yeah, I got a chuckle out of that. Oh, yeah, no kidding. We need to bring back the just bleed guy. We'll be all set. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. So the uh, like you said, you saw the contract just ran its course, but you know it it seems like there's some sort of uh, they didn't split on good terms it doesn't seem like so is there is there some sort of problem going on there with USADA and UFC wait let me interject here and, okay. and this is kind of I think part of the question is that that all came up and that contract ended right around all of the questions about Connor, Connor. and the length of his activity and and being in the pool and not being in the pool and being put on a card then all of a sudden USADA was like peace out mm -hmm. yeah it was weird yeah, no, no, it was weird. It was it was sudden. Um, I, I think it's all money, right? So so USADA didn't take the high road at all with that breakup, right? Like I I, I think Which I was like hilariously awesome, but anyway. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think I think I made the analogy of basically like a you know, like a lover spat. It just seemed like a like a public breakup of a romantic relationship the way the way USADA was sort of mm -hmm. lashing out. But but somebody pointed out their numbers, and it was something like the UFC contract was something like a third of the revenues that USADA brings in. I, I you know, again, I I forget the numbers, but it was something wild. Like it was, it was a meaningful amount of revenue, the U the UFC contract. And so when they lost that suddenly and unexpectedly, I I think they just didn't see it coming, right? And mm -hmm. and so I think that explains USADA's strange public reaction to all of it <laughs> you know, i'm kidding how do you expect this lawsuit to play out do you think it's going to go in favor of the fighters for what you've seen so far and the and the and the course that it's on i like their chances um yeah. the the evidence that they've gathered over the years just just makes a compelling case that so, so by the way like this is this is really getting dorky on the subject but <laughs> if you if you want to really understand it there's a case back it's either the 1940s or 50s okay where some guys 
had boxing monopolized. They basically owned the heavyweight championship. The way they did it is they had the fighter under contract and they had all of the uh, contenders under contract and they basically had some control over the key venues and the key TV deals and nobody could sign for the belt without um, without signing with that promoter. Like it, it was something like 97% of title fights were controlled by them. Outsiders almost had no chance of competing. So it's kind of like how the UFC has it with ranked MMA fighters. They, they just control the market. And the court broke it up. The court said it's an antitrust violation and 100% broke it up. And if you read through that case, and that thing went all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, if you read through it, and then you sort of superimpose the UFC facts on it, like what's the UFC doing to fighters right now, and what kind of market control do they have, it's basically identical. So I do like the chances. Um, the only wild card is it's a jury trial. And I think it's a jury trial because the jurors might give big dollars to the fighters but juries are unpredictable like i never mm -hmm. i never like predicting what a jury is going to do that's always a scary wild card in litigation so there's mm -hmm. no knowing what's going to happen but i i think the fighters have a hell of a strong case i think they've got a great chance of success and i'd be surprised the the ufc just appealed or they're trying to appeal the certification decision assuming that doesn't go in their favor i imagine the UFC is going to be coming to the negotiating table. Like I, I can't imagine they'd want this to go to trial. I think I think the case is that strong that the UFC needs to sit down and try to figure this out. Because if they don't, they're I don't think they're going to like what the court tells them. Like I think the court does mm -hmm. give the injunction, and I think they can afford the billions, right? Like like if if the judge or jury or whoever says you're on the hook for four or five billion dollars, not that they have that sitting in the bank, but they could make whatever deals they have to make to bring in that kind of money. In Saudi Arabia. Yeah, Saudi Arabia, yeah. Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah, you know, there's money out there, right? There's yeah. money out there. But what they can survive is the injunction. They, they, they can't have to pay that much money plus lose the ability to do business as usual. So, so it's a pretty scary um fate that they're facing if it goes all the way through the trial so so once they exhaust all these sort of pre-trial remedies to try to kill it and they're they're getting very close to the end of those remedies um i think they have to finally sit down and negotiate because i don't think they've done anything with the fighters like like i don't think there's been any offers to to, to make this go away so i imagine that's going to change in the near future so if the, if the fighters do get you know, the judgment goes their way it's it's five billion dollars just to throw a number out there what happens to that money next after WME or whoever ponies it up? Then what, what happens with that money? Yeah, so so it gets distributed to all the fighters. I, 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 again, I forget the numbers, but it's like 1,100 or 1,200 fighters are in the class. Like that's how many people wow. are right now suing the UFC. And it gets divided to them. There's going to be a formula. Like like there's going to it's going to be based on how many fights they had and all sorts of other factors. I I, I don't know the specifics, but basically it yeah. gets distributed to all of them on some sort of a prorated basis. Oh shit! And it it has to be fighters that fought for the UFC in the United States. Is that correct? I, I think so. I I think there's some some minor exceptions to that, but but generally, yeah. yeah. If you fought in the U.S during those years you're in it and, and, and yeah, again i don't have the class definition here but it, it's almost mm -hmm. everybody it's almost everybody that was in the ufc during those years there's gonna you know like like if they had an event in england and there's some undercard fighter and it was a one-off that's the only time they ever fought for them those guys aren't going to be in that class action but mm -hmm. but most most of the people that had multiple bouts are going to be part of it and as this thing does go to trial, it's going to like, will it be dragging, you know, Dana White into the courtroom and possibly the Fertitas and all these other executives over the years? Yeah, oh, I think so. Oh. Yeah. No, no. It'll, it'll be like, it'll be a MMA media circus for sure. Oh my God. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Holy shit. And the dirty laundry that would come it's out. Bjorn sits back and tackles. Yeah. Bjorn just sit back. <laughs> Bjorn finally be happy. Uh, another thing I want to touch on too before I let you get out of here 1 FC coming to Georgia now and they got the the right to use the 12 to 6 elbows and knees to the head of a downed opponent. I know you've been uh, uh commenting on that and releasing some content on that which I've been following along. Uh first of all, how? 
You know what I mean? Because it's like a, a sanctioned body covers the whole country, I thought. So how are they allowed to, you know, get special rule sets, I guess? Yeah. So so each jurisdiction has their own rules, right? So, really? so Georgia okay. is different than... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so every state, every state is its own kingdom when it comes to MMA. Yeah. And, and so when I talked earlier about the Association of Boxing Commissions, that's exactly it. Like everybody makes their own rules, but they get together once a year and they try to make things fairly consistent. Mm -hmm. But... It, it, it's just the wild west in terms of in terms of the variations of combat sports and the nuances of rules so so one just approached georgia and they're probably approaching a whole bunch of other states saying hey you know we're one of the bigger players in town you probably want us coming to your state but you got to change your rules and not everybody's going to change the rules but yeah colorado did it first for them and now georgia's doing it and i bet you a handful of others are going to follow suit and there's some tension there because I know I know the ABC spoke out against Colorado. They basically gave them shit publicly when they changed their rules to let one come in. But now George is doing it and I think others are gonna do it and and you know, not everybody will, but but there's always these kinds of tensions when it comes to regulating these sports. And and so Georgia, like most places, they've got their rules and then you could ask for waivers and that's what one did they said okay we want you to waive these 10 rules <laughs> change them replace them with these 10 rules so we could do things our way and georgia gave them everything they asked for hmm right on all right we'll uh let you get out of here i really appreciate your time i'm sorry we couldn't uh be on camera but we'll definitely have to get it done again uh one last question though before you i let you finally go so you got, you know, well, there's rule set changes now. You got the lawsuit. You got the USADA. We're bringing a new drug testing. All these other things. How much different do you think mixed martial arts is going to look in North America five years from now? That's a good question. Um, yeah, yeah. Like if I was a betting man, I'd say the the antitrust lawsuit shakes things up, whether it's settlement or whether it's trial. And I think you're going to have especially with the Saudi money now, now investing that that's a game changer in and of itself. Big time. Uh, I think you're going to have a lot more. Um, what's the best way to phrase it? I think, I think there's going to be more competition on, on the market. And I think fighters are going to be better off. I think these in-house promoter titles might finally make way for real titles in MMA like like boxing has right mm -hmm. like like the main difference with boxing and MMA is the fighters have property rights in their titles and mm -hmm. that's why they get paid so well they're not stuck with a promoter and I, I I think something like that might be coming to MMA whether it's through formal um legislation like boxers have boxers have federal legislation in the US MMA fighters don't whether it's through that or just the natural fallout of the antitrust lawsuit. I think, I think things are going to be different. The main difference is I think fighters are going to be getting paid better and they're going to have more leverage over promoters. And do you think there's any chance that there will ever be a day UFC isn't number one? Yeah. Nothing's forever. So, so really eh? sure. Uh, think so. Um, You know, whether. Yeah. The sport's yeah. So like young, whether... they could see it. You know what I mean? I don't think anyone's ever going to take over the NHL. It's just, you know, it's been a lot around so long. It is number one. Whereas, you know, the UFC came along in 93. That's not that long ago. So I guess, you know, we could see a new player in town take over. Yeah, I think the only way the UFC is forever is if they follow those other sport models. They they say, you guys are employees, and then they collectively bargain because then nobody could compete with them, right? They're, mm. they're so entrenched. And then the fighters are taking 50% of a big pie, the Fighters are happy. Everybody wants to make it in there and it's not getting shaken up with an antitrust lawsuit. So I, I think I always thought it was short sighted greed that the UFC almost wouldn't want collective bargaining there. Right. Like like they, yeah. they do everything in their power to kill the idea of fighters unionizing. But I always thought that'd be like the major league sports when the unions happened, it was always like, oh, all these rich owners are going to get poor. Nope. They've made more money hand over fist, year after year, decade after decade, the profits are higher and higher and higher. And I always thought that'd be the long-term outlook for the UFC if things were unionized. But um, with it not being un unionized, again, you just sort of go back to the 1930s, 40s, 50s in boxing. So you get some guys that end up monopolizing the sport and eventually the court says, no more for you. You guys 
you guys have abused your power and you can't even be in this business. And, and I don't think that's what's going to happen to the UFC. But I think one way or the other, they're going to lose how much power they have. And eventually, um, yeah, I'm not I'm not predicting the death of the UFC. Here, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's not my that's not my prediction, but I'm just saying they're not going to have as much power as they have. And I think there's going to be a lot more diversity in the market. So, yeah, I, I don't know that they're locked in forever. I think, I think, mm -hmm. um, you know, like put it this way. I, I never bought stock in the UFC. I never liked the long term <laughs> outlook in terms of, in terms of where they're going to be forever. Like they just can't keep on with the current status quo forever. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and let everyone know too, like I, I said, everyone listening uh, out there, seriously, if you're interested in this stuff, check out what Eric has to offer. I've been following you on Twitter for years, uh, reading at uh, combatsportslaw.com. I first time I ever came across that, I thought that was the coolest fucking thing because it's different than any other combat sports content that's out there. And I like that you keep it nice and succinct too. You don't draw it out with a bunch of uh, legal jargon and, and boring. It's really good. So aside from that, where what else you got going on? Where can people find you? Because like I said, you bring some interesting stuff to the table, my man. Oh, no, you know, appreciate that, Jason. That's kind of you to say. Uh, yeah, that's the main areas. So combatsportslaw.com is, is where I write if I have something of substance to say. And, and Twitter, I'm just sort of talking shit online all the time. So <laughs> follow me, well, you know, follow me on Twitter or, or combat sports law. And that's, that's the gist of it. All, all my other social media is just kind of cut and paste of those things. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time again. We will be in touch and uh, hopefully we get to this again. Once, uh, you know, some more stuff comes out, we'll get another update. Have you on, uh, get it started on time, get it started with a camera, do things right. Um, but yeah, thanks again for your time, Eric. For Eric McGracken, Amy Barton, I'm Jay Kelly. It's Build Downtown. We out. Peace.